of his experience for one moment, just this idea of these just, he- like they're quite large octopuses, just heavily pregnant octopus bodies kind of emerging from the water and dragging themselves across this highway um, is just such a striking image. But the image of octopus roadkill as well was something that I just couldn't stop thinking about, particularly just thinking about octopus bodies being quite soft this idea of, you know, they've got blue blood and black ink and this idea of if, if they were hit, what that looks like. So that was something that kind of fascinated me on an imagery level. But then also just that maternal drive and determination to get somewhere where they could get their eggs out and that, that kind of desperation was something that I just thought, I don't know, what is it? What is it that drives these female bodies to do that? And I just became utterly fixated um, upon the idea, it's just, I just find it, I still find it incredible. I've, you know, it's been years I've been thinking about it. Um, yeah, and so I decided um, that I wanted to write about it and that evolved into a novel. That, um, it's such a striking Im- image that it's no wonder that it really, um, it, it struck you. And I can imagine that's the sort of thing that would spark such a long-term project. So thank you for that. Um, that, that kind of idea that um, there's a, there's a link between um, women and and their bodies and the octopus and their bodies. And we'll come back to that in a minute. But I, I was going to um, actually just move to Amanda and just ask you, Amanda, so you're a natural scientist and um, one of your characters in your book, um, Elise, is also a natural scientist. And I just wondered um, whether having that perspective in your own life and in your own mind, does that change um, your view of nature when it comes to being a writer? I think absolutely, but I I don't think that it's confined just to being a natural scientist. I think that books like Aaron's, once you are able to, in whatever way, inhabit the body of an animal, like whether you're observing it in nature or, or reading this really, I mean, the, the passage at the beginning of your book, Aaron, with, with the octopus, it feels like you're an octopus moving and the way that the text flows. And I just, I love that. And so I think that there are many different tools that we can use to, to learn how to see the world from these other creatures' perspectives. And that that reminds us that it's more, it's, it's more than just about like, you know, whether we need to get from point A to point B as quickly as possible, but it, it's, it's about sort of being part of this world that actually has a lot of other species on it that are much older than we are potentially. And, um, and I think too, like at the moment, we're not hearing as much about caretaking nature now that we're all kind of locked down with coronavirus, but I think that this is the point at which we need to be sort of making our plans in secret and out in the open about how we we kind of reinvigorate um, climate action at the end of this lockdown and moving forward. I'm going to come back to climate change later, but um, I wonder when you're actually writing, um, when you were writing the breeding season, Amanda, did you have any kind of... um, was there a disconnect between the writerly brain and the scientist brain when you were writing this book? Were there sections where, oh, that's too much science knowledge, I need to pull back from that, or, you know, uh, that's not enough science knowledge and I need to kind of go further into that? That's a great question because I think for me, um, so much of my life over this last five years has been coming to terms with the fact that I don't think in scientific ways very often, even though I've been a scientist for like 20 years. Um, because science is always like, to me, integral to our own lives. And, and so for me, it's always been natural to, to see how things like metamorphosis or migration or this relationship between, between sex and death that happens in the breeding season is part of my own life. I see it reflected again and again and again. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think it's this, I mean, we're, we're kind of trained as scientists to, to sort of be objective or at least pretend to be objective. And I think that that's a major issue um, in the world at the moment, I'll be honest. Um, and I think that 
the world needs more more fiction and memoir and kind of like deep soul searching that involves science. Right. I, I think that that kind of is a um, a throw to Chris really because in Chris in your um, latest book Shell, um, looking at the world is a really really important part of that book. Um, so how you see a place. And in your book, you have two characters. You've got Axel and you've got Pearl. And they're both walking the same streets. They're both walking the harbour in Sydney. And um, they're seeing, it, it almost feels like their way of seeing um, is really important to the book. Yeah, I guess so. And I guess that's a reflection of how I, how I write, I guess. And especially um, the natural world or, or, or even the, the metropolitan world like Sydney, because Sydney's built around that extraordinary natural phenomenon, the harbour. Uh, and of course, it's littered with those beautiful parks. So uh, even writing those, and because I suppose Axel has come from a very rural part of Sweden, uh, and because the architect too was such, you know, he was, he was, of course, very drawn to nature in the way he designed um, a very organic process, if you like. And so I guess, yeah, so for me, I mean, even, even thinking and writing about landscape doesn't ever feel like I'm accessing something outside me. It feels like something that's come from inside me. Yeah. Like. It doesn't feel external to me. And so I guess that's what I wanted to give those characters to, that feeling for being absolutely a part of what they were walking on and in. Um, I've tried to think, work this out, but I know that, for instance, when I do go on country here or when I go back to Sweden, it's kind of landscape that I'm thinking about. I'm not thinking really about the people I'm going to see. Yeah. Sorry, folks back there. But I, really, it's, that's what I'm thinking and that's what I'm seeing when I'm, when I'm going back. Shell, of course, um, focuses around this, um, you know, this iconic building, the, the Opera House, which, you know, in a way represents Australia all over the world. Yeah. And, um, and yet, uh, in your book, and also in the eyes of the architect who designed it, um, this opera house is a representation of the natural world. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I and mean, he always saw it in that way. And that, that was the way he thought about everything. I mean, there was all, there's all kinds of arguments about these days about how he came up with the design but we do now that we do know that he uh, you know saw clouds for instance hovering above Cromwell Castle which is just down the road from his <laughs> his home um, in Hellebeck in um, in Denmark um, but also that he went to the Amazon jungles and and thought about the way the ruins emerge from emerge from that thick vegetation I suppose but he really you know he really did think about the shapes of nature and when he in fact when he took his architectural team back to Denmark to work there. If it was winter, he'd make them go out, go out onto the frozen lake and draw on the ice. Wow. It was, it was that organic. And when he was in Sydney, he'd take them to the beaches and make them lie down in the grasses in the dunes and make them look through the grasses to see things partial, you know, and it's a really different way of seeing the ocean to do it that way. So, you know, they'd lie on their bellies on the sand and, and use all their senses, if you like, to, to think about shape and form. Um, yeah, I've always thought approaching the, the opera house from the harbour that it looks like a, a Waratah, you know, that, that's a symbol of New South Wales. It's, but everyone has their own version. I think that's one of the great wonders of it, that everyone has a, a thing that they can think about in nature when they look at that place. One of its great triumphs. Did you have to engage with nature in quite that way when you were writing that book? Did you have to, you know, lie on your belly and look through the grass? Did you yeah, to... yeah, I did. I did all that. I followed his footsteps around and, and of course, traipsed around the place. Um, and I'm not, but I think that's one of the things about that place that people do. If you watch people, when we can again engage with that place physically, they do have a physical relationship with it. People touch it and hold it. In fact, it was one of the things that prompted me um, to write about this place it was when my Norwegian niece came over with her children and they really wanted to go, they needed to go to the opera house before they left. 
because all, all, of course, all Scandinavians claim this, this place. It's just, not just Danish, it's Swedish and Norwegian and Finnish as well. But so they, so we flew down from Brisbane and, oh, I just watched them. The twins were about 10 then. And they, the way they, they just crawled all over it with their hands and bodies and legs and feet in a way that, you know, we quite often don't. I was kind of looking for the security guards all the time because the kids were literally climbing on it. And they, they just, were, they just, but to them it wasn't strange in the way it was seen as strange to lots of Australians in the beginning. They just recognised it immediately. But these kids live on an island off the north coast of Norway, so they're surrounded by those shapes as well. I guess. There's, there's something bodily about um, our relationship to nature. It's interesting how um, you were talking about that then, Chris, and I also, um, I read it in Erin's book and I read it in Amanda's book as well, mm -hmm. that there's something um, that when you're talking about nature, it takes you into the body. So both Erin and Amanda, you've, um, you've talked about nature in relationship to, um, to female bodies. And, and both of you have actually used um, cancer and sickness as a way into that relationship with nature. I would like, Erin, would you like to um, have a little chat about how you, um, how you see nature through the body in your book? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I guess I, I began by thinking in, in relation to the human characters about just that binary and collapsing that binary of nature and culture and thinking about that in relation to the female body. Um, so I'll kind of get back to the octopuses and, and that natural world in a moment. But I began with this idea, um, which was prompted by a conversation I had with someone about if um, uh, just imagining someone who had a double mastectomy after breast cancer and then had a breast, breast, re breast reconstructive surgery and then lived to regret and how do you live with that kind of a decision? The, the conversation was prompted by someone who made a comment about a woman. They said, oh, you know, it, the cancer actually turned out to be a good thing because it meant she could get an even better pair of breasts afterwards or, or something to that effect. And the way it was presented to me was as if she wouldn't want to do that, as if it might be a natural decision for a woman to want larger breasts. And I thought that's, that's really interesting there, this idea that it is natural to, to want an unnatural body and you know I'm putting a whole heap of disclaimers around the way I'm saying that um, but and then this idea that that if you if one does have breast reconstructive surgery or if one has breast augmentation um, that perhaps the body becomes a cultured site so it's, it's something that's produced by culture and by culture cultured pressures perhaps to perform particular types of of gender roles and I guess I was just kind of trying to think through how, how these ideas of what might be natural or what might be cultural play out there. And the way I kind of wanted to think it through was to locate this particular female body in nature and see how that kind of played out in, in how she felt about herself in, in the natural world and how embedding herself in the natural world in a whole range of different ways might help her reappraise what it means for her body to be natural or cultural or perhaps something else entirely. Um, yeah, so I guess, I don't know, I guess a part of it is thinking about that, that idea of, of the female body in nature or, or the fact that when we interact with nature, it's, it's, it's somehow bodily. I mean, I think nature kind of provides this fantastic way to actually think those things through because whenever we do interact with nature um, or the more than human world, it's it's often has a bodily element so we're often i'm thinking like i was in the water today we, we often will immerse ourselves or you know bury our fingers in the earth if we're working in the garden and immerse ourselves in water there's always that kind of bodily element to it that structures the way we think about how how we're being in in the world and i think that bodily element has the capacity to kind of decenter um I don't know, notions of human exceptionalism because we're kind of moving away from, from thinking or consuming to actually just being in an embodied way somewhere. So I guess that was kind of another way that I really wanted to bring in those ideas and explore those ideas. And there's some, there, there was something for me in the idea that, um, that illness, um, that 
at the at illness and the kind of removal from nature or kind of uh, um, uh, that the, the illness and a, and a distance between the human and the natural world. It's almost like when you remove the human from the idea of the natural world, there's some kind of metaphor for illness there. Um, yeah, and also just thinking about, so the cancer thing, you know, thinking about, you know, if you're in an oncology ward, it's so sanitised. And, you know, I mean, well, hospitals in general have that just incredibly sanitised element. And we're seeing that at the moment with the amount of hand sanitizer that we're using and just the sense and the textures of those kind of illnesses is so, is, is so far removed. I mean, in a similar way, I guess, airports are as well. Like those kinds of buildings and air conditioning systems and sounds are, are just at complete opposite. And I just... I can, I mean, I'm fortunate not, not to be a cancer survivor, but I can just think if, if I had to spend that much time in an oncology ward, all I would want would be the capacity to be away from that space and in the natural world. Yeah, I, I think, um, um, Amanda, you also use sort of similar um, ideas in your book, I think, um, in terms of illness and nature, but also in terms of, um, uh, you know, female reproduction, and the natural world as well. Were you thinking through all those kind of metaphors when you were working? Absolutely. Um, so unfortunately, I am a cancer survivor, and um, and so for me, my novel was was a bit about healing um, after that experience, um, and which is it's another reason, just one more of many reasons why I resonate so much with your novel, Erin. Um, incredible. It's been a really joy to read it. Um, but I think for me, um, the trauma of cancer, and I think trauma has this way of making us feel permeable to the world in a way that we haven't been before. Like suddenly we're vulnerable and things affect us more deeply. And, and so for me, after my experience, um, feeling so small and vulnerable and um, on the edge of something. I wanted to reclaim nature for myself almost. Um, and I wanted to understand, I wanted to kind of harness all of the feelings, like all of the senses that we just, we ignore all the time. Like the way that, you know, smells and, and textures and colors and, and sounds and, all of the things that our environments give us that we, we so often filter out because we're focused on a goal that we have to achieve. And, and I think for me and for the character, um, for Elise in my book, I mean, she wants to, she still wants to achieve these great things in her life, but she's starting to learn that she needs to sort of just sit and absorb as well that that's part of living and part of sort of the richness of our experience on earth is absorbing all of these sensory experiences that we can sort of every day so many resonances between the two books it's really really interesting to kind of put them next to each other and kind of go wow these um two people are thinking in very similar ways um, and there are also resonances, Chris, for you in your work, I think, because um, there's, you have um, the idea of, of healing in Shell as well and healing from things that have happened in people's past that, um, and healing through being out in the world. There's a lot of walking in Shell. Um, there's a, a lot of walking. It's a lot. You take us on a massive walk around, um, around Sydney. I feel like I've, I traipse those streets with you. Um, <laughs> big walker in your general life as well yeah how walking influences your writing process oh it's uh, it's integral to it i think i actually wrote a story a couple of years ago about how long distance walking is like writing a novel in, in so many ways um i won't go into it into it now but for me walking a long way um i don't know things drop away you shed a whole lot of stuff and for me, that's a bit like, you know, you go into a novel with all these, all this mess around you. And, and, and it's a, for me, quite often, it's a gradual process of shedding until the essential thing 
is, is there the thing you'd come to say or the thing you'd hoped to come to say or the question you've been asking all along and in a way a walk is like that too so by the time I get to the end of a big walk like a 200 kilometer walk that's how I feel I feel you know clean and when I'm usually filthy my hair's a bit like it is now a bit like a yeti you know it's um yeah so I think you know, so I think that that idea of walking and thinking and working things out became important to Axel especially, and that might be the Scandinavian in me, I'm not sure. Um, and, and also to Pearl in a, different, in a different kind of way. But for Axel, movement and rhythm of, of, of a body moving through space and moving over a landscape uh, is how he sees the world. It's how he figures himself out. It's how he figures out the big questions he's come with, I suppose, in terms of uh, the architect and his own background in Sweden, what had happened to him. I've got a, a question for, for whoever wants to answer it really about um, the idea of, of dualism. We've had this kind of, um, this idea that the, the mind and the body are separate things. Um, and yet, and so that, that, you know, in a way that the body is, um, morally suspect because it's a part of nature um and you know that that, that some religious beliefs um, have this idea that the mind is separate from the body and it's higher and therefore it's um cleaner and i wonder whether um those ideas of dualism um ever kind of uh, come into your work just that idea that because you all deal with nature you all get you all get grubby with it you you kind of um deal with it and in a different way to how um, you know to how some religions separate those things. How do how do you feel about the mind body kind of disconnect and connect? Karen, what's, what's your feeling about? Um, I mean, I think it's a false opposition, um, and an opposition that we have drummed into us forever. But when we actually start thinking about it, it does not stand up. Um, and I think. What Amanda was saying before about this idea of, you know, if we attend to our environments, we realise how, how much we take on and, and how kind of permeable we are. We are actually just sponges. Um, so there's kind of that element, but there's also things like, you know, our um, emotions are, aren't just in our head or in our heart or, or whatever, they're psychobiological processes. So they happen for a reason and they affect us as a whole. Um, you know, like, we, we are just a whole. Um, and I think a kind of easy, in some regards, thinking about animals, um, for me, was an easy way to get, well, not easy is the wrong word, um, it was a good way to begin thinking through how much that opposition collapses. If we think about, like, an octopus, its, it's brain covers its body. So... If we think about a species like that and how does that operate, um, you know, where, where that divide actually isn't literal at all, it's a really fascinating way to sort of start thinking through how bodies move through space and that feedback. Um, and I really wanted to kind of bring that into um, my writing of my human characters as well. So things like quite early on in the novel, there's a line where um, the Lucy, the human protagonist, is kind of talking about like she can feel people looking at her, she can feel it with her skin and on her skin. And we think about the way that, that our actual physical reactions to other people are often indicators of what we're thinking, what we're feeling in that moment. I mean, for me, that, that's kind of the beginning of the collapse. Um, and I think that mind body separation, so got a long um, theological but also philosophical tradition and so much of it comes back to notions of human exceptionalism so this idea you know I think that therefore I am humans are in a particular way that animals aren't and this is the thing that sets us apart from the natural world you know is is kind of the logic but that logic itself um is is not only I don't know a flawed way of thinking but has resulted in an enormous amount of damage to the natural world and an, and, an, and an enormous misunderstanding of the natural world. And I think that it's something that creative writing has a great capacity to kind of rethink or reshape or perhaps, you know, to undermine those modes of thinking. 
yeah, thanks for that. Does it, do any of the, do, Chris or Amanda, do you have um, any comments on that? I mean. What Erin said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I might actually go back to Erin then because um, that we've mentioned several times about the voice of the animals that um, appears in your book. So um, we have the voice of the octopus, as we've mentioned, and we have the voice of the seals um, that come into it. And um, there's something really interesting about the way you experiment with um, ways of seeing with those voices. So the seals particularly, really interesting um, in that you have um, different ways of communication. So you have a particular rub up against fur that will communicate something different. So it's not what you'd expect when these seals are communicating with each other. Can you talk about the writing of those passages? Yeah, I mean, so thinking about that idea of, so a lot of, I've done an enormous amount of thinking about and reading into the way different species communicate with one another. So one of the other things that, you know, is, is a way that we kind of communicate or think about human exceptionalism is this idea that what sets humans apart from the rest of the world is a human's capacity for language and communication. And anyone kind of working in any kind of animal behaviour field will say, well, that's just not true. Animals all have really sophisticated, sophisticated ways of, or many animals have sophisticated ways of communicating with one another. So octopuses, for instance, will communicate by changing the colours of their skins and um, of their skin um, and, you know, different different patterns or flashes of colour or rhythms of colour will mean different things. Um, and so seals is another one. They're incredibly physical in the way. So if you ever um, spend much time um, on a boat at a seal haul out and you watch the way they'll shape up to one another and they, they communicate through body language, it's, it's really remarkable kind of watching those interactions play out. Um, but they also make a whole range of different noises. But then if you watch them at the water, they also listen to light. I think we've um we might have dropped out. Is um is it uh, that long? I think it, it might have been you dropping out, Erin. I'm not quite sure. Um I'm still here. You're still there? Okay, that's all. Um, okay, sorry, it just dropped out for a minute, that's all. We're still there? Yep, yeah, that's good. All right. Um, I, all right, are we all good? I yeah. think we're good. Um, those passages really stood out, and I wondered whether you um, were worried about writing them that people might say that you were anthropomorphising the animals, or whether that ever came into your head or and how you dealt with those worries about writing passages that are experimental like that? Yeah, I mean, 100% I was anthropomorphising them. Um, I won't kind of deny it, but I think... ...is human exceptionalism, but... Actually, if, I think whenever we write from an animal perspective, um, we, we're we always using human language to shape it. So there's always that element of, of anthropomorphism happening there. But the, the question is whether or not that actually has the capacity to um, decenter the human, I suppose. Um, and so a large part is trying to put a morphism as a tool of undermining and potential but really there. Um, but the the other aspect of that was thinking about how experimental approaches to writing and so some some of the animal passages are more experimental than others. How we might actually shape grammar, for instance, like that, to perhaps mimic or reflect a non human animal consciousness. So, a human reading experience might actually become in some way other, and how that itself might, you know, even though there is that degree of anthropomorphism because it's being shaped by human language, might actually carve out a space for 
and to spark that human language for an experience of of otherness in a way that might help us think in more detail about complexities of the shared world in which we live. Thanks, Erin. I might move on to um, Amanda because you also use uh, animals in a way that kind of almost reflects um, a metaphorical or a, a, a mythic kind of um, uh, representation of, of, of the human. So you're seeing humans through the animals in your story. Um, do you, did you ever feel like, um, you know, scientists could do your way of, um, of doing your writing? I think it's been an interesting process because I worried that, I mean, fiction is not something that scientists write usually, um, especially not literary fiction, maybe, maybe genre fiction. Um, but I was really drawn to the way that you can, you can use animals' lives metaphorically to, to show how we're all kind of related. We're all kind of going through the same shit. And I think that that's, one of the most important things that that fiction can do, um, regardless of what you're writing. Um, and actually, I've had so many great responses from scientists who who've said, in particular, that they they've seen a, a kind of scientist portrayed in my book that they don't usually get to see. And and of course, like that's the kind of science that I've done in my life. So going out into the field and catching animals in little traps or catching birds in nets and and so of course I have a lot of friends who are in that sort of sphere of the world but I think it's it's really exciting when you get to sort of showcase this this other way of experiencing the world with a whole new audience so yeah and, and Chris, you, um, I happen to know a little birdie told me that you are engaging with science in a very different way, that you are actually looking at genealogy a little bit at the moment. Um, I am. Just to set everyone to sleep. Um, <laughs> so yes. Looking at the world, that kind of digging deep into the ground. And trying to see whether, you know, what's beneath our feet actually informs who we are um, and actually informs how we move around the world and who we are, absolutely. And, I mean, some of that's leading me into really interesting areas in terms of, uh, well, all kinds of stuff. But Aboriginal people, of course, we haven't mentioned tonight, but of course they have their own very special relationship with, with landscape in, in ways that can teach us a great deal. And one of the things I'm learning about is um, that many Aboriginal people see rocks as sentient. And I really believe that as well. I really, the more I've been, you know, this, project's been going for years now as they do with me and the more I've sunk into it if you like metaphorically as well as physically the more I really think that that everything beneath our feet has a memory and that we're part of that absolutely and so looking at why a particular part of New Farm still holds me and grounds me more than the 26 houses I've since lived in is all part of that, that there's something about, <clears throat> you know, me digging underneath all those houses and coming up through the earth on that block of land at, at New Farm and what it's, you know, how it's made me in, in, in every possible way. So, yeah. Right. Just um, before I actually open up to questions, so if anyone has any questions, make sure they're ready to go. Um, before I open up to questions, I would like to um, look at how we're, all in isolation at the moment in our kind of separate isolated spaces and how um, that effect will affect um, you as writers and your relationship to the natural world when you are in these you know when we are told to stay home to not go out in nature, to not engage with it how does that affect you and your work um Aaron? um so i'm semi in a great good position in that I actually live on 14 acres across the road from water um so for me um it would be utterly insufferable if I was living in an urban space I don't I've never written well in or lived well in urban spaces um which is obviously why I've ended up making this decision to be here where I am although I do I am finding quite stifling in Tasmania at the moment because um, pretty much in 
in my local region, all surf beaches are in national parks and national parks and reserves have all closed down. And I've always known how much, in the same way Chris was kind of talking about walking being central to her riding practice. For me, surfing is, I don't know, absolutely key to my riding practice because of the mental clarity I get when I'm in particularly in remote places and there's no one else around and um, I'm just immersed in the ocean. But also I, I think... I'm probably a little bit hooked on the adrenaline and endorphins from it, but I suddenly have that removed from my life. Um, and I'm finding things are just a little bit diminished, um, despite the fact I've got that space. Um, I'm still writing a lot, but I, I think, I don't know. Yeah, things are just a bit diminished, I guess. How about you, Amanda? How, how are you feeling with the, the lockdown? Um, so I guess for me, it's, it's been a challenge because I often work from home, um, with, you know, I work at cafes and stuff though too. And so it's been a bit stifling. I have, I live in a townhouse and we have like the smallest courtyard. <laughs> um, so that's been a bit of a challenge. And now also I have, you know, a husband and a daughter at home working with me, which is different. So I've found that I've needed to make um, make a new space for myself out on. You said, Chrissy, earlier you're on a little you're in a little cubby in your in your place, and I've had to make myself a cubby at home, and it's actually out on one of the tiny balconies outside our bedroom, and I've like set myself up out there so that I can sit and do my work and look up at trees and birds and there's not a lot of traffic at the moment which is nice and and so just kind of even though I don't have a lot of access to nature because we're not supposed to drive anywhere really to go outdoors um I'm trying to like make the best of it inviting nature in perhaps yeah definitely and Chris are you um, managing to get um your connection to nature mm. um, yeah, I am. Um, in fact, I was actually on the O'Reilly's Plateau when the, um, when the shutdown happened and I was walking those lovely paths every day. So it, it sort of felt really personal <laughs> to me when, when it all was, you know, blocked off. But I still get to walk with lovely Sally Piper, who's in the audience there. We get to crawl all over the, um, the backside of Mount Kutha every now and then together. And I think without that, I would feel strangled, really, because it's just, it just seems to be part of how I... How I breathe, but I think at the writing level, um, a few writers I know are having real difficulty, and I wonder whether it's because everything we were writing before this happened sort of fades a little bit. I, I can see enormity of of this of these changes and and the relevance of what we were thinking before <laughs> sort of changed a little bit. So I think everyone's in a way trying very hard to still do what they were doing before, but it, it, yeah, it's, it, it's doubtless that we're not doing it in the same way. I think so. We will see. Mm. I'm going to open up to questions now. So, Emma Kate, have there been any audience questions? Yes, I have had quite a few. Chrissy, you've covered a couple of them, unfortunately. Um, but I'll read out the comments that went along with them and perhaps um, you can jump in if you'd like to elaborate on something that you've already touched on a little bit. So the first question that we had was from Ella and it was for you, Erin. And um, Ella said that she loved the narration from the non-humans in the book and um, is wondering what your process was like developing the structure of the language for each animal. So perhaps you could touch, elaborate a little bit more on that process for us. Yeah, totally. Um, so it was different for each animal. Um, for the octopus, um, or the, the two different octopus narrators. Um, it, it was an incredibly organic writing process that kind of sprang out of a year of feeling really intimidated and trying to figure out how to go about doing it and reading as much as I could about um, octopus um, sentience, personality, um, behaviours and physiology. Um, so I, I kind of, my hope was that because they have quite a unique sensory experience of the world and so I kind of wanted to bring that sensory language into how I wrote about, um, about them or wrote from their perspective because they obviously move through the world in a particular way and feel 
you know, feel or experience that, that physical experience of the world is really unique. Um, but I also wanted to try to manipulate grammar so that the flow of sentences, so they'd somehow mimic the way an octopus moved because I kind of felt like in thinking about how, you know, there is that mind-body collapse, that process that, like, if we think of, of words as being some kind of thought process, I wanted it to also have a physical element to it. So that was kind of my hope. Um, and then I, I yeah, I sort of agonised over it and then one day it came out and it changed very little from that first draft, but I think that first draft could only have happened if, if I, you know, had spent so long thinking about it. Um, with the short-tailed shearwaters or mutton birds, um, I really wanted to think about the fact that birds do have that flock quality and, and mutton birds um, flock in, in amazingly different ways. And so they, they'll raft up, but there'll be thousands of them sort of bundled up together out like in the middle of the ocean and they'll just, you know, ripple and flow along with the, the swell. Um, and then they also migrate. And so what is it that makes, you know, thousands of birds suddenly come up together and, and fly across the world? And so, but then at the same time, they'll also then splinter off into pairs and they're very connected in that pair bonded way with the way they'll nurture a chick. So I kind of wanted to think about how I might create not only an individual bird's experience, but its experience as a part of that flock or a flock mind, but also the pair that kind of pair bonded mind. So that that really informed um, the way I wanted to be writing about the birds. Um, the seals are the kind of least experimental um, approach to writing, I guess, in, in terms of form. That was in part because seals are most of the three species, seals are kind of most similar to us being mammals. Um, but it was kind of informed a little bit by thinking about um, by thinking about that kind of gender divide that seals have. So the, um, the female seals all hang in a particular area and then the male seals, when they get to a particular age, they go to other areas and then, then they all kind of congregate somewhere else for the, for breed, um, for the breeding season. Um, and I kind of wanted to be thinking about the, the hierarchies and the kind of pack dynamics and the impact that would have on a seal's sort of sense of individuality. Um, and then that was kind of reflected in more realist writing, which was um, or more, you know, realist, less experimental writing, I guess, which was in part because it, I wanted it to be a slightly longer, slightly more kind of character and plot driven story rather than um, an experimental kind of fly into, into that, that sensory experience, I guess. Can I, can I ask, ask something or add something to that? Um, yeah, one of the things I liked about the seal part too was um, the the way that you play around with ideas of masculinity, which is something I think you do a lot throughout the novel. Um, what does it mean to be a man and, and all of these different perspectives on maleness and the way that the seal kind of changes perspectives over the course of our time with them is really cool. So just wanted to add that. Uh, take that as a comment. <laughs> Emma Kate, any more questions there? Yeah, we've got um we've got a a comment that is sort of going to prompt hopefully a few recommendations or responses from you all about um uh what your thoughts are on this. Um it's from Bronwyn and Bronwyn has said that they wonder how a book with nature beings, trees, rocks, so um flora rather than fauna as the characters would be written and what it would read or sound like. And um, Bronwyn says that they love walking in nature and communicating with nature spirits. Um, and they think that we need to realize that we are nature, not separate and superior to nature. So does anybody have firstly recommendations, I think for books that were, uh, yeah. I wonder whether Chris, Chris, have you thought about the idea of voice, like the voice of rocks, the voice of um, the geological things? Has that been a part of your research? Uh, not as such. Uh, for me, it's much more, um, Walter Benjamin talks about the, the idea of emanation. And for me, it's much more something that emanates, not as a voice, but as um, almost like a wavelength or a, a pulse that informs something in you that's already there, if you like, that animates something uh, in, in you. So, um, 
Yeah, I'm not sure if that answers the question or not. Would you recommend Walter Benjamin as, as um, an author that people should read? Um, you have to be fairly picky with which bits of Walter that you read. <laughs> you have to kind of, you know, look look pretty deeply. But I, mean, I, I just really don't think you can go past people like Barry Lopez in, in that way because he writes just, or Rick Bass even, he, they just write so viscerally about about the natural world that you can't help but feel part of part of it you know bodily part of it after reading something that they've written yeah do the do Erin or um amanda have any ideas of books that um that also take you into those voices of the natural world um i wonder if um heat and light by ellen van nerven would be worth checking out there's so it's a kind of collection of short stories divided into three parts, but the middle part is kind of about plant people. Um, it's quite experimental, but it's an absolutely striking piece of writing that sort of does that kind of a thing. Um, so that, that was the one that automatically jumped my mind. Um, and this is not a recommendation, but it's something I've thought about and I can't figure out how to write it or if it, I suspect it probably wouldn't be culturally appropriate for me to write it but there is a river in New Zealand that's been afforded rights um that was happened a year or two ago and so it could I mean that kind of thinking about the politics of the non-human and whether the non-human has rights I think is just an incredibly fertile space to be thinking but it's probably important to be thinking about who who should be telling those stories as well and how they're kind of implicated in different types of, of cultures and Amanda, do you have any comments there? Uh, to be honest, most of my reading in this area has been in the space of animals. And um, so I can't really offer any recommendations on plants or rocks or other components of our world. I'm, I'm uh, except, 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 sorry, um, that I often find a lot of inspiration in looking at um, old texts, um, sort of maybe botanical drawings or um, sort of maybe even geographical drawings and kind of old texts, the way that people describe things differently from how we describe them now or drew them differently from different perspectives. And um, so I guess I often take inspiration from that kind of thing and that might be worth investigating. I'd also like to recommend Robert McFarlane's Underground, um, Underland, Underground. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, if anyone hasn't read it yet, it's fantastic. Yeah, we also have a recommendation from Tara, who's in the audience, um, The Overstory, Robert Powers. Um, I've got two more questions, if you are all happy to answer them. Um, so the first is from Josephine. It is, um, how has writing about and through your body affected your body at the time? Erin or Amanda? Amanda? Oh, writing. I guess I try to be more present. Um, I try to, to, to sort of absorb senses and experiences more now and recognize where they sit in my body than I used to. Um, and that's kind of come in part from writing, um, kind of exploring the story, because for me, the, for a long time, all I could write was about my experience with cancer and loss of fertility and fear. And, and so every time I wrote, it was about kind of recognizing where that was in my body and how the outside world affected that. Um, and now I think I'm better at recognizing when things are affecting me sort of in my body viscerally. and um, using that in my writing, but also using that to kind of be a, a more grounded person. Was it a release to write about, um, you know, those things specifically when you'd been through the cancer experience yourself? Yeah, definitely. Um, but, you know, it's funny because I wrote, a, I wrote an essay um, about a year before I started the novel called Pluripot Pluripotent, which is about stem cells, but it's also about that time in my life um, 
where all of these different kinds of stem cells relating to my breast, my lactating breast tissue and my cancer and, and everything was, was happening. And I felt an intense release after that. And I thought I was done. I thought, oh, this is it, you know, I'm over it. I'm, I'm moving on. And, um, and then I ended up writing a whole novel about the same kind of thing. So I think it's hard to tell. I don't know if we ever truly let go of these things, but we just kind of, we learn how to let them be a little bit better. I think it's really interesting because writing itself is a bodily act, mm. physical thing. And we feel everything in our bodies, everything we feel. I mean, we write, I know I write in longhand, so it's definitely a physical thing. But, but grief and joy, we feel them. And we talk about them in that way as well. They're totally embodied experiences. So there's no getting around it. We sit down to the, at the desk, no matter how we write, um, we, we feel it top to toe, I think. Um, Chris, I remember very viscerally you talking about Frozen Shoulder at a time when you were writing a very difficult book and how it felt to me as if your body were kind of embodying the difficult. Absolutely, absolutely. And all the magicians... Uh, I consulted after I consulted all the scientists who couldn't who couldn't seem to help me said the same thing and the, the first one who alerted me to this was was a homeopath a young a young homeopath who you know looked about 15 at the time and um, sat down and talked to me and asked me about what I was doing and what the story was about and then turned himself around and consulted this book the size of his own head and, and then turned back and said oh so um, the family scribes writing the family story but she can't use her arms and then he asked him other things like well what have you been holding on to too tightly um incredibly prescient questions that really centered for me you know the whole idea that i both of my shoulders were buggered that i couldn't do anything with either of them um was all about fear of course it was physically grounded but it was also about this book the psychology of writing. Erin, did you feel physically changed by writing about the body? Um, I don't know if physically changed is necessarily the word, although I'd kind of agree with um, what Amanda's saying about how that when you are writing about the body to get the right words, you become really mindful of your own body and try to figure out how to get those words in the same place, in the right place. And even though I had this really... Um, I was a kind of embarrassing moment, but um, ended up being being quite wonderful. But I was um, at a writing residency and I was in a room um, and the other person hadn't showed up yet. And I was trying to write this particular scene where um, the character swims with an octopus and she's like on her back and was trying to figure out the right words. And so I sort of had them just sitting there and I had my arms closed and I was sort of flapping them around, trying to figure out like how she'd be fl floating and moving and where the octopus would fit and kind of acting it out and then heard this sort of <coughs> um, and the other person doing the residency had shown up and was like lurking in the door trying to figure out if she should come into the room or not. Um, I mean, she ended up being quite good friends. So, you know, it was all good in the end. But I think like that idea that Chris was saying that writing is this embodied act, it's, it's kind of, it's so true. And if we are writing about the bodies and thinking about how bodies move and often we'll be moving our bodies or faces or, or whatever, but also, yeah, we do experience emotions, the characters. I think that's a really weird thing about writing a novel compared to a short story. My experience is you sit with the characters for so long that they become real and they start doing things or driving things because that's what that person would do in that situation. And so when stuff happens to them, you know, you care or you're there with them. And, you know, there's, there is that connection, I guess, and that, that affects you physically. Thank you. So Emma Kate, are we we're at time probably? Is there something we are? I'm wondering if we have time for just one last question. It's very um relevant to the moment as well. So if you're all happy to stick around for an extra couple of minutes, um, that would be lovely. So our last question is from Bianca, who's another avid reader darling of ours. And she says, firstly, congratulations, Erin, on your debut novel. I've thoroughly enjoyed hearing from all of you tonight. Um, a question perhaps more for Amanda and Erin. Do you get the feeling or is there evidence that our understanding of nature, both flora and fauna, and how we interact and communicate with the natural world is increasing with the global climate emergency? 
Erin? Uh, yeah, okay, I'll go first. Um, yes, uh, 100%. I think, and it, that kind of goes back to what I was saying before about ideas of human exceptionalism and how we kind of need to shift the way we're thinking about that nature culture divide or that mind body divide. We are in the process of seeing the results of modes of thinking um, and modes of humans being in the world that kind of, that you know has been happening for how many decades but then escalated with the industrial revolution and it's becoming increasingly obvious that it's not okay like that this that we need to make changes to those ways of thinking um, and behaving and consuming um, yeah and so of course it's something that is becoming increasingly um, present in in cultural artifacts that are being produced and I, I kind of wonder because there's a lot of it in Australia how much this is also um, a reaction to to our government um, and to particular policies so how do we actually if, if you are a writer if you're an artist how do you make change it's, it's by creating things that are going to position people to think and feel in different ways and you know we can only do that with the hope that that's going to actually enact um, political change and change changes to consumerism and things like that. So, yeah, 100%, I think it's connected. I 100% agree with that. I think it's all about driving empathy in the direction that we think is important and creating the characters and the stories that do that. Chris? Oh, yeah, what the other two said. <laughs> and in terms of really animating, I think, I mean, I, these days I can't go walk through even Mowbray Park without touching the leaves of trees and speaking to them as if they can speak back because we're missing that right now. And we're also, of course, in danger of losing everything. So that whole idea of just everything is animate, everything is alive and breathing, mm -hmm. just like we are. And yeah, as Erin was saying, you know, we've made ourselves exceptional and yeah, we've been exceptional at destroying lots of things. So um, I just, you made me think of something, Chris, just there, um, that I think right now we're all quite focused on our bodies because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And from this, we need to be able to pivot to focusing on the environment again. And I think maybe as writers, this is a place for us to explore right now, how we pivot from the body to the environment, not just from the environment into the body. I think, um, I think it's a really important question. And I think um, anyone who is interested might wanna tune into, we have a, a panel that's just dropped in called Writing the Anthropocene, which is all about um, the idea of writers um, engaging with um, that, with the natural world and with climate change and how we need to do that, particularly at this time when we're thinking, we're looking internally at um, viruses, um, but to also know that those viruses wouldn't be here without the changes that we have to our natural world as well. Can um, I just mention that one of our great nature writers, James Bradley, has a new book out. That, um, yeah. He is the focus of our panel, which is writing the Anthropocene. Ah, excellent. Great. <laughs> piece of that panel and his new book too so um do check out the avid reader website and tune into that one too it has been an absolute delight to wrangle this panel today um and i would um like everyone to put their hands together um and in fact i think we're going to unmute everyone um as we yes. so i'm going to unmute you all now so that you can join me in thanking chrissy Christina Olson, Erin and Amanda for a wonderful evening and thank you of course all for attending. I will drop both of those links that I mentioned to you earlier um, in the chat box now and I'm about to unmute you all to say thank you. So here we go. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Have a lovely evening. Bye. 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 Bye.